polis. Or it's also for you, 25 minutes, you can start whenever you're ready and I will wave at you when you run out of time. Okay. Right. Just come. I lost my place. But I have a church on clean in this area, if possible. It's easier for me to present from here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> no, it's fine. Thank you. So, hello everyone. Uh, my talk uh, today is about the measurement validity of the well-known index of commensurate variance. I guess all of you know uh, what commensurate variance are, and probably you also know that uh, those variances are responsible for many positive aspects of social reality around us: democratic, democratic institutions, rising freedoms. Uh, rights, tolerance, trust, declining violence. And also the very orientations, at least partially responsible for all these uh, positive social changes. So it is a very important concept in modern social science, not only in terms of uh, its theoretical importance, but also uh, in terms of its policy implications. However, recently some scholars uh, write questions about the measurement validity of this index and this debate is very important. So uh, that's my main motivation why I uh, would like to investigate this talk. Uh, unfortunately I have only about 20 minutes so I cannot show uh, all the interesting parts of my presentation. I have to skip some of them. Uh, but believe me, I will show you the most interesting parts. But before I uh, present my uh, most important findings of my study. Let me briefly recall what the index of the various are. Actually, the second order constructs, which combine four first order constructs, and each first order construct is defined by three absurd indications. The first construct, also, measures personal preference on child autonomy. Second construct, includes uh, measure personal preferences uh, for gender equality. Third construct, measure individual uh, priorities on reproductive choice. And finally, the fourth construct, measures personal uh, priorities, personal demand for political uh, rights and freedoms. Each uh, absurd indicator is rescaled to the range from 0 to 1, and the overall index is just a reflected average of all first number indicators. Uh, for those of us uh, who are familiar with uh, classical measurement theory, the model on the fiber uh, looks like a typical example of second order uh, factor analysis, also known as uh, hierarchical factor analysis. So it's a reasonable first step uh, for testing the validity of the tickets to proceed with uh, informative factor analysis procedures. Uh, this figure presents parameter, standardized parameter estimates for the index of the values. Uh, the data used are third, put third to six uh, ways of the world body survey, uh, 99 countries in total. And we see that uh, this model looks quite acceptable. Uh, some factor loadings are low, but in general, it's okay. The model fit uh, for this model, look at the first column of the table, is also acceptable. So, uh, some scholars uh, who prefer methodological purity might say that uh, these values of two main fit indices, C5 and MC, are only rough acceptable, but recent surveys show that you can publish paper with such uh, model quality even in top uh, level psychological journals and you know psychologists are guys uh, who are addicted to measurement quality issue if you can persuade that model if you can persuade psychologists that this model is good you can persuade anyone so uh, in general the basic CP model for the MST values uh, is good uh, one worry is that uh, some modification indices uh, 
indicate the presence of multiple non-zero non control solvings and residual covariances, uh, which in turn may suggest that uh, some other combination of observed indicators in the first and second order construct may fit the situation, may fit the minority. So uh, it's not well, also a very critical point. Uh, but what is critical is the fact that uh, the models I have shown uh, right now uh, is estimated using the data from whichever all countries in the world, from 99 countries. And we know that our world is quite heterogeneous and diverse. Some countries are similar to other countries in terms of the cultural, uh, political institutions, economy and so on. But some countries are rather difficult. So uh, it is reasonable to ask whether the model uh, performs in the same way in different cultural areas of our world. This question reflects the well-known uh, problem of measurement invariance. Uh, what is measurement invariance? In fact, it's a kind of uh, urban legend, like Loch Ness uh, Lake Monster. Uh, nobody reports that uh, confirmed sightings, at least in our large and social service, but everybody seeks to find measurement invariance. Uh, technically speaking, uh, measurement invariance essentially requires that uh, all key model parameters uh, do the same in each possible subsample of your total sample, uh, divided in respect to some grouping variable. In our case, uh, that grouping variable is scan. Uh, there are three orders, uh, three main order levels of uh, measurement invariance. So the first one is configurable invariance. It requires only that the loading parts uh, are the same in each country. Uh, the second order of invariance is uh, metric invariance, which requires that all factor loadings should be the same uh, in each uh, subsample. Finally, scalar invariance requires that all uh, item intercepts should be the same in each country. It is, it is suggested in a methodological literature that we can compare some countries on the uh, Everyone's various curves only uh, if the scalar invariance is established. Maybe it was very frustrating claim, but uh, the problem with the index of inversive uh, values is the fact that uh, it does not satisfy even the assumption of configurable. In the world, which is the biggest, uh, biggest assumption in, in effect. Uh, this table presents the resu results of separate and fermentary factor analysis for 10 cultural global zones defined as the recent results of book uh, Fridge Horizon. And we see, obviously, from uh, the table, that the loading patterns are not the same uh, across these 10 cultural groups. And what is most striking? It is not uh, the same, uh, they are not the same even uh, in the most developed countries in the world. I mean, uh, cultural groups, uh, New West and Old West. So, actually, one can conclude from there that uh, emancipated values, the index of emancipated values, uh, performs not well across the world. But, one positive finding uh, concerns the choice. It is one of the component of the various and we see that factor loadings are quite stable and large in uh, all uh, cultural zones. So it is uh, possible that choice reflects some uh, really existing value dimension, or maybe it's uh, better to say that it's not a value dimension, but kind of personal trait. And maybe it is possible to prove invariance at least for one component of the values. Actually, it is possible. Uh, the exact variance approach uh, is not suggested, but if you will use a new developed, uh, new developed approach, which is called approximate Bayesian invariance, you can prove invariance of the choice as across 10 cultural zones, and also across all 60 countries, which are included in the latest uh, six a wave of the world for the survey. Okay, well, what it does mean? Uh, it does mean that choice is really existing to dimension, 
uh, and people actually combine the items, measure chairs, measure room chairs in their heads, but people do not combine other items and other sentiments in the in their heads. So it's it's also not very surprising, right? Some other scholars uh, have pointed out that the dimensionality of mental defects and other values is, uh, is uh, under question, and uh, Rizvi also and Romy have also pointed it out in the recent papers, but they do not consider the fact of uh, non invariance as problematic for the theory and for, for the measures. Uh, recently, they prepared a paper, which I hope uh, was corresponding in comparative political studies, and uh, I should say many thanks to Chris, who shared, who shared uh, this paper with me, because it's uh, allowed me, allowed me to greatly improve uh, quality of my argumentation. So, uh, what is the essence of the defense of the United of various index? Uh, one crucial point is that uh, the index was designed to measure every level constructs. So its uh, individual level properties are not of great importance for assessing the validity of the aggregate level inference. Another crucial point is that the index is defined according to so-called combinatorial logic of index construction, not dimension. What is combinatorial logic and what is dimensional logic? These two types of uh, these two approaches to creation of multi-dimensional constructs are better known as uh, formative and reflexive measurement, so I would prefer to use terms uh, reflective and formative measurements as more common in uh, contemporary methodology of research. Uh, what is the main difference? Reflective measurement uh, is a component of uh, very common statistical procedures like structural equation modeling, like uh, factor analysis, it assumes that we have uh, some unobserved or latent variable, which is uh, the cause of variation in observed indicators. So the direction of causality is from our latent variable to our observed indicators. <laughs> in formative measurements, our latent construct does not exist independently of uh, observed variables. It is defined by the so if we exclude one item from this collection of observed uh, indicators, we get another construct, not the same. Uh, both approaches are powerful uh, and have the advantage and disadvantage. But one problem uh, with formative measurement is that the criteria of uh, measurement quality are not so straightforward as for reflective measurement. But uh, Chris and Ron suggest one important and I think very powerful criteria. Uh, it is uh, external validity. Actually, uh, during the recent decades, many papers show that Aegis and Nancy uh, really demonst uh, demonstrate a very powerful, uh, very high explanatory power and therefore have uh, high external validity. But if we assume the formative interpretation of the index of sensitive values, we, from my opinion, should conclude that the index does not reflect something that exists empirically. It just defines a measure of distance from some theoretically set, uh, set uh, sorry, from a certain defined state point. I fully agree. If this measure has obvious empirical uh, correlates, it's there. But I, during the rest of my presentation, I would like to ask some questions, not just, uh, just questions, about uh, some additional indicators of measurement validity of uh, formative constructs and, uh, in particular, of uh, the index of emancipative values. The first concern I would like to point out uh, is that 
the index of emancipated values and its justification in recent uh, paper by recent uh, does not fully satisfy the definition of formative measure. Actually, it's not so very easy to distinguish the informative and reflective model in practice. Uh, law at all suggests uh, one simple taxonomy of measurement models in social sciences. And they argue that uh, the key cr criteria for the distinction between formative and reflective measure is whether the construct operates and exists at the same level as its indicators or not. As for me, I couldn't, uh, I can't uh, say with certainty does emancipated values are more abstract construct that uh, they indicators or not. But I suggest uh, to conduct a small thought experiment which may be quite insightful in uh, the first step. Uh, you know that uh, we very hard times businesses around us and uh, it's very really possible that uh, in the near future world economy can uh, worsen and what uh, it will be mean for social sciences. It uh, will lead to the decrease in funding, uh, probably the uh, decrease in funding of the world for the service. And uh, as a question, uh, as a consequence, the length of the pressure also should be reduced. And uh, imagine that uh, some of indicators measuring one of the components of the analysis of values were excluded from the question. Uh, now consider three simple questions. The first question is whether one can make a, at least approximate inference about country being scored on the basis component using the information, using the absolute mean scores on other components of emancipated values. Then, whether one can make at least inference about the direction of the effect of the missed component on some other country level aggregates uh, or in. And the final question is whether uh, the lateral inferences will substantially change if one suddenly gets the misinformation and then reconduct the analysis using uh, uh, certain information on all scores, uh, on particular scores, on emancipated rates. I have no ultimate uh, answers to these questions, but the empirical way of use of emancipated values and my own understanding suggests that the answers to the first two questions would be yes. And the answer to the last question will be no. So, uh, this indicates that at least par partially we can interpret the subcompanies of financial values as, uh, to some extent, interchangeable. But this uh, leads us to conclusion that the latent interpretation, I mean, uh, reflective interpretation, is more preferable than formative one. Another minor point is that the use of highly correlated indicators in creation of uh, formative measures is not recommended because it can cause some est uh, estimation problems. However, I already saw that uh, the choice, which is actually the one of the dimensions of financial values is a really highly correlated dimension. So, uh, now let's consider another abstract example, a uh, simple simulation. There is a setup for simulation, we have three uh, first order constructs and one external outcome variable. The first construct has a strong, has a strong positive effect on the outcome. The second construct has a uh, moderate positive uh, uh, effect on the outcome and finally the third construct has a uh, moderate negative effect of our uh, outcome variable and all constructs are correlated to the level of 0 0.6 so it's quite high correlation so we made it reasonable to combine these measures uh, into single second order construct 
and then image a researcher who observed only constructs and the correlations between them, and also had a theory that Kruger stated that the combined second order construct should have a positive impact on the outcome we Okay, okay, you using the same data that uh, we, we use for simulation, we can estimate another model. And interestingly, the fit for this model will be specified. We very good uh, for all statistical standards. So, uh, so if the true model is not uh, known for readers, for reviewers, uh, it will be published, accepted, and will have uh, some influence on uh, in the field. The same is true if, if we follow uh, formatic logic of model creation. If and just uh, simply aggregate all scores on uh, observed indicators and then regress our outcome on this combined score. Also, fact is positive, our survey is supported, uh, everything is fine, but we miss this negative link between uh, one first order construct and And variable. So what we can learn from this little example? Uh, it tells us uh, that even misspecified model, misspecified both in terms of reflected or formative measurements, doesn't matter if it's strong, uh, misspecified model may fit well according to any statistical criteria. Uh, and they also may have a uh, high exponential power, but in fact, they may obscure some true models. So if we have any evidence of misspecification, we should take it seriously because uh, this evidence suggests uh, the presence of some better model, which can be better not only in statistical terms, but also substantial. Uh, let me illustrate uh, this insight uh, with some empirical example. Let's consider uh, correlations between different uh, particular components of mental awareness and the index of effective democracy as defined in our uh, center of Wilson and Engelhardt 2012. Uh, here we see that equality and choice correlate with the effective democracy at least uh, such stronger as emancipative values uh, themselves. And more, in the case of equalities, when we uh, use uh, non-parameter correlation efficiency, equality correlates with uh, effective democracy even stronger than emancipated values. Uh, then, let's look uh, to the rather, uh, simple regression analysis. Here we see that uh, autonomy is not a significant predictor of effective democracy, uh, and uh, what is significant but on our last, when we get uh, either uh, equality or voice, the significance of the voice disappears. And uh, the most striking finding, when we combine choice and equality into a regression equation, uh, we get R squared even higher for the uh, composite score on the message. So, in fact, we see that uh, two particular components have uh, higher exponential power than uh, the total score. So maybe, in fact, uh, it's not important for effective democracy, uh, the total score of all emancipated values. But what is important is a particular score, scores on choice and equality. It's a very trivial finding. I will not interpret it. It's, it goes beyond the scope of my study. But I think that's uh, it's actually important to uh, <coughs> In conclusion, I would like to slightly clarify my main point. Uh, I do not try to challenge uh, the theory of organization in general. I respect its findings. I think that it's uh, really poor theory. But what I would like to do, just to point out that at the current stage of the theory of development, uh, we have still uh, we still have some need in further clarification of its crucial component, the operational component, the concept of emancipated values. And uh, as a 
consequence, we have a need for future research, for future research, both on measurement of values and possibly on associations between particle components of emancipative values and some other aggregate level variables of interest. Uh, generally speaking, that's it. I would be very grateful for your comments, criticisms, and suggestions. Thank you very much for your attention. Boris, uh, it's time to listen to our two discussants. Why have I been chosen as a discussant? <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't even report myself. Um, well, of course, um, I'm feeling flattered. Uh, someone takes my concept so much apart and uh, spends so much time for, for doing what I, what I have done. Uh, that uh, makes me really feeling great. So. Um, Thank you for that. Um, also, um, I congratulate you for the for the courage. Um, I have to say because it's probably not easy for a junior scholar to take on hands on a senior scholar and the last uh, 10, 15 uh, years of his work. Um, that <laughs> requires something. So um, chapeau for that as well. Um, thirdly, um, you executed that. Uh, in a very sophisticated technical way, uh, better than Alaman and Woods, who have published a similar criticism already in uh, comparative political studies. Um, my problem right now is that um, I cannot respond too much uh, because then no one will come to my lecture tomorrow, uh, <laughs> where I will disprove every point, point by point, uh, that you will see. So um, I only make three remarks here. Um, the first one, uh, I will point this out a little more, more detail tomorrow. The first one is the individualistic fallacy. Um, I believe that large parts and what we have seen here is all in the framework of multi-group confirmatory fact analysis. I think this is a gigantic exercise in the individualistic fallacy, to be quite honest. Um, the notion goes back to um, partly to Max Kasem, who pointed out in a famous essay in 1986 in the Kölner Zeitschrift, uh, the, the micro-macro puzzle in the social sciences. And what it refers to is a very regular observation that patternlessness, uh, lack of coherence, uh, weak external linkages at the individual level, data, um, often coexists with very clear structures, patterns of correlations, patterns of coherence, external linkages at the aggregate level. And we have many examples, the examples are abound, where we have relationships at the aggregate level that have the opposite sign at the individual level. We have examples where a uh, relationship at the aggregate level has not an equivalent at the individual level. Um, the conclusion from this was the two levels simply don't speak to each other. In other words, there is a wall of non-inference that separates the individual from the aggregate level. There is, you can in no, in no way predict an aggregate level pattern of coherence, correlation, regression from anything that is at the individual level. Now, what you have done and what others have done, uh, when they want to validate an aggregate level score in a multi-item index, they go down to the individual level and look at the measurement properties there. So they don't consider there is a wall of non-inference. They're violating this principle. Everything what you find at the individual level is of complete irrelevance for that same measure at the aggregate level. Because also it means something very different. The same two attitudes correlated at the individual level, and then the me uh, an aggregate level, a measure of the central attitudes correlated at, at the country level, means something completely different. At the country level, you would see how much prevalence patterns in these two orientations, norms, whatever it is, correlate with, with each other. So we would kind of measure a norm strength. At the individual level, we measure whether person A also has attributes B. So these are two very different things. So for that matter, I would say that um, it's just an exercise in the uh, individualistic fallacy. 
which means erroneously concluding from patterns at the individual level to the validity or realness um, of those at the aggregate level. Um, the second point, you, you picked it up a little bit, but I would simply say um, the whole business of testing whether something is a latent variable just doesn't apply uh, to what you call formative constructs because they do not run under these requirements. Uh, formative constructs allow A for multidimensionality and they allow B for variability in the dimensional pattern from one aggregate unit to another if a third condition is fulfilled. And that condition is uh, what is called compository substitutability. Um, to clarify that point, um, with one example, you have seen uh, an average score of emancipative values is calculated from 12 different items. So the same average can come from various different combinations of individual scores. Uh, in one country, the autonomy index might be stronger than the choice index. In another country, the choice index might be stronger. In yet another country, the equality index might be stronger. And yet, the overall average measure might be the same. Um, that doesn't matter as long as the overall performance maps on theoretically predicted outcomes or theoretically predicted antecedents of that concept. So what matters in the end is external linkage. And that refers to the latter part of your analysis. Here you moved in the right direction. This is what matters for a, con a construct that is sold as a formative one. You have to be able to demonstrate that the combination you create is more powerful in its external linkages, whether to the antecedents or the consequence of the concept, more powerful than its single components. Now, um, you have shown that uh, at times, A or two single components can be as powerful as the overall measure. In that case, it would be justified to only chose the smaller subcomponent. In fact, the, the reason why I not only provide the overall measure of emancipative values, but also its four subcomponents, I publish them as well, and they are available for researchers, is exactly to have that freedom of choice uh, depending on what you are analyzing as your outcome variable. Now, why I nevertheless combine them together is because my theory says that there are many outcomes that I expect theoretically from a man's of bodies, like environmental sustainability, women's empowerment, effective democracy, generalized trust, cooperative behavior, um, life satisfaction, and all kinds of things. The interesting thing is, that for each of those possible outcomes, you will have another lead indicator of the four subcomponents that will vary. The point, however, is, and this is what I will, de would, uh, will demonstrate tomorrow, the overall index always captures, at least very close, but mostly captures or trumps the power of the most powerful subcomponent, and therefore, over various possible outcomes. Um, this is still, um, from, from my perspective, the preferable, uh, preferable measure. Anyways, um, the thing is that our piece, uh, the response piece to Alamon and Woods, is also be published in Comparative Political Science, and I think it covers everything from 1 to 0.4 in your paper. Um, and I think this is then beating a dead horse. Uh, when you go on working on that, you can only make technical improvements to what they to what they have done. You should expand the point five of your paper and exactly um, go along with these um, suggestions, and um, that will be a very promising piece then for a journal. Thank thanks you. again. Thank you, Chris. And thanks for leaving also something for tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have uh, a similar problem because I also want to leave something for tomorrow. But, um, so I want to be short, uh, sweet, and to the point where I, um, what I think are the most important issues from my point of view. In contrast to Chris, uh, I uh, think that one, when one tests really complex theories uh, with multi-level models, one has both individual effects and contextual effects, whether they are aggregated or not. And as soon as you are 
using in a multi-level model individual effects, and a lot of people do this, they do, and look, for example, at uh, cross-level interactions, for example, and then the question is whether these individual variables which they use, whether values or other variables, are really comparable over countries or groups. And from this point of view, I think, especially when one is running multi-level analysis, with individual effects, then it's still necessary to think about this invariance issue, whether one uses now more, uh, let's say, liberal methods like Bayesian estimation or maybe even checking for the robustness issue, which is a new research area, now very promising starting uh, to see whether it's really so bad, it's not only zero one decision, invariance given or not, but I still think one needs it. And I would differentiate between the issue of formative versus reflective indicators, which is one issue, and when one really uses a formative indicators, then one would have to run a mimic model, really, to formally test it, I think, it would be better than using just an index for emancipated value, it's a more unbiased estimate. Um, and uh, on the other hand, the issue of aggregation multi-level models. So these are, for me, two different courses, so to speak, the issue of uh, reflective versus formative, and the issue of aggregation. And I hope we can continue tomorrow the discussion, because I'm not convinced by, till now, at least by Chris's arguments, uh, that really, because of aggregation, he has solved everything, <laughs> uh, going to aggregation issue, because I think when we run multi-level models, and we have in the uh, contextual variables, whether they are aggregated or some, uh, Vari variables in, in themselves, we ha uh, have then this problem that the individual effects have to be invariant still, and we still want to look at cross-level interactions in a lot of cases. So this is, uh, and in general, I want to say it was a really very good presentation, a very good, interesting work, and uh, one should discuss how to continue this uh, research agenda. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Boris, I think you got very insightful comments. Do you want to yes, reply? Sure. Uh, <coughs> prepare it. If, if you want to get also some questions from the public, I advise you to maybe be short and. Okay, I, I try to be as short as possible. So, uh, first, I would like to respond to you, Peter. Thank you very much for comment. Uh, partly I agree with you, but I would like to point out that uh, Marcel Modeling has. Uh, focused uh, on uh, the individual level, our dependent variables are also the individual level, so it is uh, just an appropriate method to work with some aggregate level constructs. But, but you absolutely true, uh, the aggregate level and the individual level are two different parts, and the issue of aggregation and the issue of formative and reflexive measurements are two different uh, points. So now I would like to respond to Chris. Again, uh, thank you very much for your comments, very insightful. Uh, but I would like to mention two things. Uh, one is uh, ex ante, no one construct is formative or reflective. So uh, the choice depends on some set of conditions which make uh, the type of uh, measurement more preferable in this. In this concrete situation. Uh, and uh, another point uh, is about aggregation. Uh, you correctly um, pointed out that uh, the individual level associations are not the same as aggregate level associations. I absolutely agree. But uh, I just mean that measurement invariance is not about associations. It's uh, about properties of the instrument. Uh, measure of invariance reflects the situation when our country level scores are biased. They may be biased uh, due to the phenomenon that he calls uh, earlier phenomenon, but it's only one uh, possible cause of bias uh, in the measurement. Other causes also may take place and also may be significant. Uh, so the general point uh, is that if uh, when we use individual level data to measure some aggregate level constructs, not to measure, not to estimate the uh, associations with some other aggregate level uh, variables. Uh, 
we should uh, reflect the possibility of bias in means, uh, but bias, biases in means may be strong, and then they lead to biases in ordering of countries and the aggregate level, and they also may uh, violate the functional form of the associations of the aggregate level construct with some other variables. Just that possibility. Uh, measure multiplorians uh, concept has uh, some limitations, but I think that uh, it's a question of empirical debate, not only theoretical, but we anyway should uh, take it in mind. But in general, I, I, I'm very grateful to you for comments. So in papers, I hope that it helped me very much in my research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Boris, for being effective. So, uh, <coughs> Probably one or two minutes for questions. I'm not sure there will be answers, but questions. Are <laughs> 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 human right? <laughs> Come on, by now. You, oh, yes. <laughs> 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 Coming. It's, it's just a comment, um, which is um, sometimes when you do something academically, you can benefit people without even intending to. So um, I just wanted you to know that I really appreciate um, the work that you're doing because in a way, I, I didn't know about the debate at all. And so just in, in having the opportunity to hear about the debate, um, you have actually indirectly for me really benefited my own work. So I wanted to thank you for that. That's You're the welcome. Comment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions or comments? Then I think that Boris deserves a very good hand. <laughs>